So we are going to continue with the topic of groundwater and discuss groundwater exploitation. Groundwater has been rapidly exploited with little regard for long-term effects. Some of these effects of groundwater exploitation include lowering of the water table and the formation of cones of depression, saltwater intrusion, and land subsidence. Groundwater overdraft is when groundwater use exceeds the amount of recharge into an aquifer. So if groundwater is withdrawn faster than it can be recharged, basically meaning we're overusing the wells without the amounts of precipitation needed to recharge the amount of water that was taken out. The result of that could be lowering of the water table. So lowering of the water table can be seen in these diagrams here. So here you have the water table is pretty high and you have a river here that's filled with groundwater as well as upstream sources as we talked about during the river chapter. Here is a swamp that is filled with water from the groundwater. If you were to put in a whole lot of wells and pump a lot of the water out, it lowers that water table. So then you have to dig deeper to get to the water table. So that costs money to dig deeper wells. Okay, but that's lowering of the water table. And then the river dries out, the swamp is dry. And they have to use water to make the grass grow still here. Okay, so they're, ta they're using groundwater because you can't use river water or water from the swamp, right? So you're gonna just keep using groundwater and it's gonna keep increasing this problem, making it worse. This is going to continue to be a problem in urban arid regions where there is only minimal precipitation to recharge the groundwater. In these cases, groundwater is not really considered to be a renewable resource because it can be depleted especially if conservation efforts are not taken, which would then start mitigating the problem of over pumping the wells. For example, there is an issue in Las Vegas, Nevada. It's a desert, arid region. It's an urban area with a high population. They use a lot of water and they are depleting their groundwater supply. And local surface water is also being depleted. So areas like that, you, the groundwater is not being used in a sustainable way. So you, the, the cities in areas, in, in climates like that, could run out of water. Okay? They're not using water resources sustainably. And here is another example of the water table dropping. This is in what we call the High Plains Aquifer. Two to 100 times more water is taken out of the aquifer than what is recharged. So the water table is dropping in many areas. And here we have different colors. The water level change in feet from 1980 to 1995. So wherever the water table increased is blue. So we have a little bit of increase in the water table, but mostly we have the warmer colors, the oranges, yellows, and this dark red. So those are declines in the water table. So the lighter yellow means the water table has dropped five to 10 feet between 1980 and 1995. So it's a range of five to 10. Okay, and that this dark red color here means that the water table dropped more than 40 feet. Okay, 
so that's in here. And then this maroon color is area of little or no saturated thickness. Okay, so you can see a lot of the drop in the water table is in western Kansas, southwestern Kansas to be more specific. So I looked into that a little bit and there was some information about farming and raising of cattle and Western Kansas is running out of water in the aquifer. So here's more information about that if you're interested. Okay, but a lot of the, a lot of that drop in the water table is related to livestock, you know, um, raising animals. Okay, and here you have the ground has dried up. If you look more closely. This drought, as seen here in 2012, is a constant concern for anyone living in Kansas, particularly those involved in agriculture. Drought can shave billions of dollars off farmers' balance sheets and devastate communities, but irrigation can make the difference between survival and losing it all. Okay, and then here. Corn and beef production alone, fed by the Agalala Aquifer, employ more than 56,000 people and add $3.2 billion to the Kansas economy, amounting to 4.3% of its jobs and 10% of the economy. But you have this significant drop in the water table related to that agriculture. Okay, now the, the High Plains Aquifer is also the Agalala Aquifer. Right. Then we have California, where you have change in groundwater level. And if you go to this website, you can click the past decade or the past year. And it shows you the, the groundwater level changes. So when you do the past decade in this diagram, it was 2004 to 2014. And then if you were to click on past year, when I did this, um, they may have updated the website since, but um, it was also showing you 2013 to 2014. So the red shows you a decrease of 10 feet or more, right? And you see the rest of it. The blue is an increase. So you can see there's not really that many areas of an increase, it's mostly dropping. So there's a significant problem with groundwater overdraft in California. And a lot of this also has to do with irrigation related to agriculture. There's a lot of agriculture in California that requires a great deal of water, but the drier climate does not allow for the amount of precipitation that they need to recharge the groundwater. So a lot of the farming in California is not sustainable, meaning it can't go on and on and on forever. Like they're gonna run out of water. There's gonna be a water problem. So then more specifically um, related to overusing wells, we have this problem called cone of depression. So when you have a well that's pumping really fast without enough recharge coming back in from precipitation, let's say, you form a cone of depression. And that's this dip in the water table that surrounds the base of the well. And this always reminds me of um, a thick milkshake or a really thick smoothie. If you put the straw in the smoothie or the milkshake, 
and you sip really fast, you will see the liquid right around the straw will kind of form um, a dip. It'll kind of like sink down lower right around the straw. Okay, you can, um, you can test that later. Okay, but you'll see that right around the straw, the smoothie will like dip down a little bit more. Okay, so you're forming a cone of depression when you do that. So when, when you do, when you have these cones of depressions, it could cause other wells that are nearby that are not as deep to actually go dry. So like if these people here had neighbors, let's say over here, that had a more shallow well, let's say their well was a little bit more shallow to begin with, their well is gonna go dry because it's not as deep as these, right? But initially the groundwater level was higher. Okay, let's say the water table used to be up here. Okay, so then the people that live over here are not gonna have any water in their well. Then we have saltwater intrusion. And this occurs in coastal communities and it's a contamination of the fresh groundwater supply with salty water. And this occurs with excessive pumping of the fresh groundwater without enough recharge from precipitation. It allows the salt water to come in to those wells and fill in the spaces instead. Okay, so this scenario is before pumping starts. You have the water table here with fresh groundwater. And then you have this salty groundwater lens kind of below the fresh groundwater. Salt water is more dense than fresh water. So salt water and fresh water don't readily mix. And the salt water usually stays below the groundwater, the fresh groundwater. So if you start to pump, let's, you put this pump in here, and let's say you over pump and you don't have enough rainwater to contribute back to the fresh water in the ground, then that salt water is going to start going into the well. And then you can't use this well anymore because it's salt water. So then they, they have to either dig a different well, like somewhere else, or they have to find surface water, or maybe even construct a, a um, desalination plant, which is a facility that removes salt from seawater. Okay, but that's an expensive facility. Then we have land subsidence. So the removal of groundwater can cause poorly consolidated sediments to become compacted. Now, when you're in a situation, again, California as an example, it's a drier climate. So they have to use a lot of groundwater for irrigation for, for agriculture. So the dates on the poll show the subsidence in the San Joaquin Valley in California. So let me explain. So in 1925, the, the elevation of this land was up here. Okay, it, it may seem a little confusing when you first look at this, but the land elevation used to be up here. Then in 1955, the land elevation, it was here. So that's a big drop. This photo was taken in 1977, showing you this is the new elevation of the land. So between 1925 and 1977, the land subsided nine meters. 
That's because they removed a lot of the groundwater in this whole area. And the sediments that were in the aquifer underground became more compacted together after the groundwater was removed. Now this is not reversible. You can't just like pump more water back into the ground and then expect the sediments to get farther apart again, okay? This is a permanent change to the sediments that they became more compacted together. So this shows you that people can actually change the elevation of land. It's pretty amazing how much subsidence you had. And this is because of the irrigation of crops. And for a time, surface water was used instead of the groundwater, and that reduced the subsidence, which is good. But then between 1987 and 1992, they started withdrawing more groundwater during a drought period, and there was more subsidence again. So this shows you land subsidence in the San Joaquin Valley between 2007 and 2011. And these different colors are shown in inches. So you see around here, that's that fuchsia color, which is, let's say in the 40s, right? 40 for, to 43. I'm just seeing 40, but this color right here, um, the, the fuchsia, and then you have like this lavender color. So these are in like the low 40s in amounts of inches that the land has subsided just between 2007 and 2011. And this shows you in the San Joaquin Valley the subsidence between 1988 and 2013 was 4.8 feet. So subsidence is continuing in, in the San Joaquin Valley. Okay, so the land used to be here in 1988. Now in 2013, the land was here. So even between 20, 2004 and 2008, you had a drop just in that four year period right there. So now we're going to talk about limestone dissolution, which leads to the formation of caves and what we call karst topography. Limestone can dissolve easily when it comes in contact with acidic groundwater. So that is limestone dissolution. So why would groundwater be acidic? Carbon dioxide from the atmosphere or in the soil can become dissolved in rainwater or in groundwater. And when carbon dioxide dissolves in water, it forms carbonic acid. So the result is rainwater and groundwater that is slightly acidic. So water and carbon dioxide gives you H2CO3, which is carbonic acid. So groundwater is naturally slightly acidic. And rainwater is as well. We're not talking about acid rain, which is caused by pollutants in the atmosphere that add acidity. We're talking about just natural process that causes groundwater and rainwater to be slightly acidic. So limestone is a common sedimentary rock that when we talked about the epicontinental seas, that seawater covering much of the continents during different periods of time in geologic history, 
a lot of limestone was formed. So we have areas of the world where you have a lot of layers of limestone. Limestone is composed of calcite, the mineral calcite, which is calcium carbonate or CaCO3. Calcite is easily dissolved by carbonic acid, which means it's soluble. And here is a photo of a piece of calcite dissolving after a drop of hydrochloric acid is applied. So limestone and also other rocks that contain calcite like marble are going to be soluble. So karst topography is where surface landforms develop when limestone bedrock dissolves both at the surface and in underlying cave networks. So underneath the ground, if we have limestone, rainwater and groundwater will touch that limestone and over time it dissolves it. So we end up with these caves underground and then at the surface of the earth, you have certain topography and certain landforms that form related to this dissolution of limestone. So this map shows you this magenta color is karst regions around the world. It says map shows major carbonate rock outcrops that provide a close global scale estimate of karst regions. Okay, so you see in the United States, we have this line of land that is associated with karst regions. And we're gonna talk in a few minutes about caves and caverns that actually lie on this line, okay? And you can look at different areas around the world. And this is a more close up just of the United States. And it tells you carbonate, limestone, dolomite, and marble. So those are rocks that can be dissolved by acidic rain, uh, rainwater or, or groundwater related to limestone dissolution. Okay. Dolomite is similar to limestone, but it's it's a little bit of a different composition, but dolomite is also dissolvable with acid. Okay, and then you have some other rocks like gypsum and rock salt, which could be dissolved as well. But in this lecture, we're specifically talking about carbonate rocks. Now you see also in Florida, there's a lot of carbonate rocks. And I'll show you a map a little bit later of what we call sinkholes, sinkholes that form in Florida. So different examples of karst topography include caves and caverns, sinkholes, solution valleys, which are just a line of sinkholes, disappearing streams, and karst towers. And this is a diagram from the book showing you features of karst topography. So here you have caves underground. Now, when you see limestone drawn on a geologic diagram, usually it looks like this like these bricks. That's usually how limestone is drawn. 
Okay, so you have this whole entire network of caves underground within the limestone. And they're showing you here, you have um, a lot of joints and fractures in the upper surface of the rock. And that allows for more groundwater to rainwater to pass through and become groundwater. So that's partly how you have dissolution is you have fractures that allow the water to pass through. And then the fractures will get enlarged because they're, the rock is being dissolved. Here's a disappearing stream, pretty much just what it sounds like. A stream on the surface starts running down into a cave. Okay, so we'll talk about more of these. So caves, here is a little cube of limestone with other rock types. Okay, so perhaps this color with the dots in it, perhaps that's a sandstone, let's say. And then this lighter gray is limestone. So water in this landscape has seeped down into the joints in the rock and it ended up dissolving caves in the limestone. Okay, but you don't see any caves forming in the sandstone. Okay, it's just going to affect the limestone areas. So caverns are large systems of caves. We have Mammoth Cave in Kentucky, Luray Caverns in Luray, Virginia, Howe Caverns in New York. Here is a photo of a, the inside of a cavern. This is Luray Caverns in Luray, Virginia. Then we have sinkholes. Sinkholes commonly form when limestone layers dissolve underground. And then the roof of the cave may collapse into the cave, forming a crater at the surface. This type of event sometimes follows a drop in the water table which leaves a cave empty that used to be filled with groundwater. So when you lose that water pressure that was holding up the roof of the cave, when the water drops in the water table, you lose that water pressure and then the roof of the cave can cave in basically. Okay, so here we have groundwater dissolved the limestone. And again, the upper layers, this is not limestone, this upper layer, right? This is the limestone where you have the holes. And then as the caves grow, it causes the roof of the cave to be more vulnerable to falling down. Okay, there's less support on it. And then eventually the roof caves in, collapses, and these are your sinkholes. And then also, like I said before, it, is, it can be related to a drop in your water table. So here this like um, grayish color is showing you where the water table is. And you have this cave underground in the limestone but in this case, you have just sediment on top of this cavity. So in this case, the water table has dropped and the sediment starts to fall down into the cave. You have like, it slumps. So this is also a sinkhole that hasn't actually collapsed fully. Okay, and then here the the poor palm tree fell into the hole. The sad little palm tree now. This is 
just an example of what some sinkholes can look like from an aerial view. So there are these little lakes. They become lakes when the groundwater fills in the holes. Okay, otherwise they would just be like a depression in the ground that they don't always have to have water in them. Okay, but in this in these cases, they have filled in with water. Then we have disappearing streams. This is a photo of a disappearing stream in the Hudson Valley in New York State. So the stream is flowing on the ground, flowing, flowing, flowing. Oh, it disappears underground. Okay, where does it go? It goes all the way into a cave. So this tells us that there's some cave uh, somewhere down there. And the stream now is flowing underground. Okay, it flows underground rather than at the surface. So it seems to disappear. So we call it a disappearing stream. Then we have something called karst towers. So here you have a landscape where you have fractures in the rock and water seeps down into those cracks and dissolves the rock, but it dissolves along those fractures, which in this landscape, the fractures were vertical. So you have this dissolution along those vertical fractures. And then eventually, as the water dissolves downward, it brings the whole ground level down. Okay, so you're, you, you're dissolving the rock. So instead of the water being all the way up here, now the water is down here. So you've lowered the whole landscape where the fractures were you bring the water table down lower as well. But in between those fractures, you still have the rock that was at its original elevation. So now those are left as karst towers. Okay, but that's the, the top of the karst towers tells you the elevation the land used to be, um, like all continuous flat across. And this is what karst towers look like. It's a very dramatic looking landscape. Kind of unusual for us because we don't have anything like this locally. Okay, so the landscape used to be up here, flat going across, and then groundwater dissolution brought the landscape down here. The, right, so like part of the landscape is now at this elevation. So karst towers are common in parts of Southern China. Okay. And because karst towers are such a dramatic landscape, um, I heard in the movie Avatar that they used some of the karst tower topography as the, um, whatever the name of that planet was that they were on, mining for resources. They used the karst topography, the karst towers from China as the landscape, as part of the landscape to be on another planet because it's so dramatic looking. So that's pretty, that was pretty interesting when I heard that. Then we have dripstones. Dripstones form when water droplets that contain dissolved calcite drip from the ceiling of a cave. 
And the dissolved calcite came from the water dissolving the limestone. So when water dissolves the limestone, the water then contains dissolved calcite in it. So then some of that water drips down from the ceiling of a cave and droplet by droplet, you have calcite crystals forming as solid once again, okay? So it crystallizes back into solid material, but it happens like droplet by droplet. So over time, over time you form kind of what looks like icicles coming from the ceiling, okay? Crystal by crystal, droplet by droplet. So stalactites are the dripstones that grow downward from the cave ceiling. And I like to think of it as stalactites, where the letter C reminds me of the word ceiling. Stalagmites or when you have calcite formations forming on the floor of a cave. So it's when the droplets hit the floor of the cave and then you have growth going, growing upward from the floor of the cave. So I think of it in terms of stalagmites where the G is for ground. So hopefully this helps you remember stalactites, C for ceiling, stalagmites, G for ground, and then a column is when they meet. And then a drip curtain forms kind of looking like tapestry that hangs off of a wall, kind of like draping over other parts of the cave wall and then travertine terraces. So these are dripstones. The soda straw is like that little thin icicle looking material, uh, you know, piece hanging down. And then it eventually turns into a stalactite. Stalagmite again builds growing from the floor upward. And then when they meet, eventually they turn into a limestone column. Here's another diagram, stalactite, stalagmite, limestone column. Here is more looking like a drip curtain. Okay, this is a drip curtain though. So it's, again, it looks like tapestry kind of draped on the, the wall of a cave. And that's, it's all formed the same way, the dripstone, droplet by droplet. So when you go into a cave, like on like a, a tour, they tell you not to touch anything they tell you not to touch the, the stalagmites or the, the drip curtains because the oils in your fingers will disrupt the dripping of the little droplets. So they actually tell you not to touch anything. So when I was little, I, we went to one of these, I think, I guess it was Shenandoah Caverns. This looks really familiar. And there was one spot where they said, okay, you could touch this one spot. And it basically is just cold, wet rock that feels a little slimy because it's just very smooth and wet. So, um, but yeah, the rest of it, they're like, don't touch anything. So it forms really spectacular looking features. And also, Inside a cave is completely pitch black, but um, cause they'll like shut off the lights to show you just like, hey, look how dark it actually is in here. So they shut the light for a second, but um, 
you know, pitch black, absolutely no sunlight. So it's completely black. So people who like to go into caves as a hobby, that's called spelunking. They'll have like um, a, a, a light on their head as they crawl or climb inside caves. So then we have hazards related to sinkholes. So this is a pretty famous example of a sinkhole in Florida. It's 100 meters wide, 35 meters deep, and it formed in May in 1981 in Winter Park, Florida. So it formed in an area where there was limestone that was dissolved underground. And then the water table dropped at some point. Well, I mean, before May 8th, um, the water table dropped and then the land, set, you know, collapsed. So that is, you can see some damage to some of the homes, right? So that's a pretty significant event. And then in February 2013 in Florida, near Tampa, a man fell into a sinkhole that formed in the ground beneath his bedroom floor. This is a horrible thing that happened. Um, I think he was sleeping. I don't know. This is um, very, very horrible. And this is an image of the floor where the sinkhole formed. Okay. I mean, he died um, tragically. He, he did, he did die. Um, and apparently they filled in the hole, someone filled in the hole. And then um, I believe the house was taken down so that no one else would live there, but they, they filled in the hole and a sinkhole reformed after they filled it in. So um, that's not going to be a good spot to just keep refilling. They probably should just leave it and just, you know, and that's it. Because you have a hole underground, so you can't just keep filling in the holes. So this shows you the sinkhole um, prevalence in different parts of Florida. So you can see here is Tampa Bay. So this is the Tampa region. And you see all these blue dots. That tells you sinkholes have been reported. So this whole area of Florida is um, sinkholes happen there, okay, up here too. And then the different colors, like this color right here, sinkholes are very few, but several large diameter deep sinkholes occur. Okay, and then you have this brighter color red. Sinkholes are most numerous of varying size and develop abruptly. The yellow is sinkholes are few, shallow of small diameter and develop gradually. So if you're gonna live in Florida, I don't know, maybe look into this map. When sinkholes develop gradually, it's safer because then you know, okay, that's sort of collapsing, you know, slowly and gradually. Like, you know, it, you see it happen. The ones that where it, it's abrupt, you know, that's a lot more dangerous. I mean, obviously, right? This happened abruptly. There was just this sinkhole formed abruptly and it formed very deep. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the groundwater lecture.